tonight's event is about reinventing yourself for success. Uh, before I continue, I'd like to thank uh, Mrs. Gerland Zantini uh, for allowing us to use this venue. I'd like to thank Ronald Henderson, Mr. Raji Javad, and Mrs. Ruth Javad for helping me to put this event together. Before we get started, I'd like for everyone to just introduce themselves to one person you don't know, and then we'll get started. Okay? Yeah. Hi, I'm Debbie. Introduce yourself to someone you don't know. Hi, I'm Debbie. I'm Dan. Oh, you get to meet everybody. <laughs> okay, so five weeks ago a seminar was given here. The seminar was given by a faculty member at Hofstra University. And the purpose of the seminar was to educate the public on the upcoming changes that will take place. 21st century workplace. This is what I learned when I came to the seminar. Um, corpor corporations have figured out that right now they can take 45% of the human workforce and replace humans with robots. Uh, robots don't require 401k plans, robots don't require health insurance, robots don't require maternity leave, robots don't require vacation time. It translates into billions of dollars of savings. And so if 45% of humans can be replaced by robots, that means that 100% of the human workforce will be competing for 55% of jobs left over. So we can only imagine how fierce the competition will be. And so if we're in that environment, it's going to take a lot of experience and a lot of education uh, to compete for a good job. Uh, having experience and having a college education will get you through the door. But once you get through the door, this is what the employer will be looking for. The employer is looking for people who are confident, people who are creative, people who can interact with people on any level, people who can multitask, people who have a sense of humor, uh, people who are risk takers, uh, and people who can stand before large groups of people and talk. Does that mean that we need to stop worrying? No. Does it mean that we should go into panic mode? No. Does it mean that we need to be prepared? Yes. Are we prepared to survive and be successful in the 21st century workplace as we are. And so why is it that corporations uh, are looking for people with these talents? Well, we're no longer living in a national economy, we're living in a global economy. And so a lot of companies are competing. They have to stay, they have to stay uh, competitive and they have to stay profitable. And so they're looking for people who can help them keep the company competitive and profitable. And so this is something that I want you to just keep in the back of your mind as I go through this talk. Okay? Uh, a little bit about me. I'm from Virginia. Uh, my mom was uh, a seamstress and she went on to work in the post office. My father worked for Reynolds Metal, the company makes rental rack. And uh, they're both in heaven now. I have uh, three brothers and one sister. Uh, one of my brothers is here today, Ronald Henderson. And um, this is a picture of me when I was 19 years old. This is in Virginia. I'm in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia with some friends. Uh, and I'm driving a 1971 Volkswagen Bug. Uh, no moon roof, no air conditioning, no power steering, no power brakes. Uh, the engine was in the back, and the trunk was in the front. Very fun car to six years. But the, at the age of 14, I realized that I wanted to be a part of people becoming successful and finding their purpose in life. And I really didn't know how I fit into this picture. Uh, but I knew that's where I fit in. I knew that. That's what I wanted to do. And so I started washing cars. I started washing cars, and 
and I had a paper route, and I worked at my grandfather's church, and I always made errands for elderly people in my neighborhood. I did that for two years, and then I finally got a job working in college. When I got a job working in the college, uh, this was an exciting moment for me because now it's going to actually collect a big check. And I reported for work. I remember I reported for work that day at 3 o'clock with my notepad and my pen ready for training. And the chef brought me over to the grill and he turned on all the eyes. He gave me 350 steaks. He gave me a spatula and a hat and told me to have those ready by 4.30. I didn't really know what to do, so I just started doing it. So I just started throwing all the steaks on the grill, and uh, by 4.30 I had them done. Okay? Um, graduated high school a year early, not because I had a 3.9 grade point average, but I just felt that, you know, Virginia was born for me, and I wanted some excitement in my life. So I graduated one year early, moved to New York, got a job at a company called Temco. Temco was a company that did cleaning for uh, corporations. And so they had a contact with Newsday, and I would work at Timco uh, through Newsday. Worked there for about a year, got a job at a hospital. And when I got the job at the hospital, I worked in the kitchen. And I did, on the side, I did auto mechanics. I would bring my car to you, I would take your car, and I would fix your car. You needed an oil change, you needed brakes, you needed a tune-up, whatever you needed, I would leave my car with you, so you had transportation. Take your car and fix it. Run it through the car wash, bring your car back to you and take my car. People really loved it. But I didn't love it so much because the weather conditions, you know, when it's getting cold outside, and, you know, cutting my hands, and getting grease up under my nails, and, you know, I just, eventually I just got tired of climbing up on these cars, okay? So I found out in the hospital that they have a program that you can go to school for anything medically related. You can go to school to be a pharmacist, um, respiratory therapist, lab technician, x-ray technician, um, and a nurse. So I enrolled first to become a CNA, and then I enrolled in a nursing program. Uh, and while uh, in school, I found this book by Zig Ziglar. I don't remember uh, the name of the book, and I don't remember everything that was said in the book. But here's what I do remember. In the book, it said that when you take on a job, you should always do the jobs that nobody wants to do. If you do all the jobs nobody wants to do, you move up the ladder. If you don't move up the ladder, that's okay, because you're gaining experience. And as you gain experience, you can take that experience with you to the next job. And you just keep repeating that process. And if you just keep repeating that process, then you'll become very successful. And uh, I can testify on my own behalf that nursing is best. There's many times when I leave work very frustrated, very exhausted, uh, but I can tell you that when I get into my car, I'm very grateful that I have a job. Very grateful that I have food to eat. I'm very grateful that I have shelter. And, and I say this because I've traveled to different countries where I've actually met people who have homes with no windows, no running water, no electric, and they're content. And so I really feel that you know I have a lot to be thankful for. I'm very healthy. Never been in the hospital before. Anything. I have a wonderful family, I have great friends, and uh, I, I, I really believe that when you come to this place in life where you can really uh, appreciate the simple things in life, then life takes on a deeper meaning. And, and so, although this is my talk, this is my give back talk, this is my talk for you, uh, and I certainly hope that this talk will bring you to a place of where you will understand all that you are and all that you can become and move you closer to your purpose in life. And so, uh, again, I want to thank everyone for being here. And now I'm going to go into this talk. And um, let's enjoy ourselves. Okay, so the name of this talk is Reinventing Yourself for Continued Success. And I'm going to cover three topics, building confidence, recognizing an opportunity, 
and turning problems into challenges. Okay, so I'm going to start with the story. I once worked at a life care facility. It's a life care facility because they take care of you until you die. In order for you to qualify to live in this life care facility, you have to have at least $1 million in assets. Okay? The facility sits on a 750-acre campus. They have golf courses. They have swimming pool, a tennis court. They have a gym, fine dining, entertainment. They have a beach. They have beautiful cottages on the property. They have condominiums. They have assisted living, and they have a nursing home. I worked in the nursing home as a charge nurse. And uh, working at the nursing home, I was able to meet uh, some of the members of this community. One of the guys that I, I met in this community was a man named Jack. Jack was a very wealthy man. And Jack would come over to the nursing home because his wife was there. His wife uh, could no longer live in their condominium because she needed skilled nursing care. And so Jack would come over every day to see his wife and to take care of his wife. And uh, we, know, we would laugh a lot, we would joke a lot. Uh, but on this particular night, it was very quiet. And Jack was, uh, he was sitting in the hallway while his wife was being cared for. And I walked up to Jack and I said, Jack, I want to ask you a question. I said, you know, I need your advice. I, said, I feel like I've come to a place in life where there's more for me, there's, there's more that I would like to give back, I feel like I like to help people on a larger scale. I said, and I would like your advice on how I should go about doing this. So Jack said, well Larry, the, what you have to understand is the first thing you need to do is you need to find an opportunity that fills a need. Once you find an opportunity that fills a need, the next thing you need to do is you need to do your research on the opportunity. After you do your research on that opportunity, you've got to give it all you got. He says, now I want to say this to you again, you have to give it all you got. Because oftentimes what happens is that people come up with ideas and then they, you know, they, they, they research the ideas, and then they go to work on the ideas, and they, they experience culture shock. Because once they realize the work that's involved, they give up. That's one of the reasons they give up. The second reason they give up is because their friends and his family members will say to them, this is not going to work. You're wasting your time. You should go back to working your job. So, a lot of times, and this happens quite often, people don't pursue their dreams because they listen to other people. And they don't have the perseverance to continue. So he said, once me and my wife were looking at this car dealership, he said the car dealership was in the right location, it was the right price, and it was a Chevy dealership. He said, we couldn't believe the price they were selling it for. He said, it was real cheap, and we decided that we would look into this firm. He said, so we went home and we, we went over the numbers. And after we researched it and we went over the numbers, we came to the conclusion that this was a gold market. So we decided that we were going to buy this car dealership. But before we did it, he said, I went and I spoke to two friends of mine. So he said, I went to the first friend and I said to him, you know, me and Betty, we saw this car dealership, it's the right place, uh, it's the right price, it's a Chevy dealership. Uh, what do you think? You know, we did the numbers and we think we're going to make plenty of money. And he said, his friend said, Jack, don't do it. Don't buy the dealership. If you buy the dealership, you're going to lose your money. Whatever you do, don't do it. So Jack said, well, I didn't just decide to buy it. We, we, we did our research and came up with numbers that were just incredible. And we really feel that this is going to work. He said, Jack, don't do it. Don't buy this dealership. Somebody else owned the dealership, and they didn't do well, so what makes you think that you're going to do well? He says, don't do it. So then Jack went to his second friend. His second friend owned a Ford dealership. And so Jack went to him and he said, you know, I want to, me and Betty, we looked at this dealership, we did the numbers, we think it'll do well for us. Uh, what do you think? He says, Jack, don't do it. Uh, he says, it's just a, a bad deal. I, I don't think you should do it. Uh, again, someone else on the dealership, uh, they didn't do well. Um, you're doing well right now where you're at. Stay there. Don't buy the dealership. So Jack said he's, he went home, and him and his wife went over the numbers again. 
And after going over the numbers again, they were still convinced that this was a going. So they bought the dealership. So you said they bought the dealership, and one of the things they did over everyone else is they gave outstanding service, and Jack said that he was on the showroom floor himself selling these cars to make sure that these cars would sell. He says, and it was almost an overnight sensation. He said, people were buying these cars like crazy. He says, and once we made money from this deal, what we found out is that the two guys that told us not to buy the dealership were convincing us, trying to convince us not to buy it because they wanted it for themselves. So he said, we went on and we bought Oldsmobile. Uh, Oldsmobile eventually went out of business, and then we bought Nissan. He said, so we had Nissan and we had Chevy. He says, and Larry, I've made my money. I've just turned the dealership over to my son because at this point, I just don't have any need for money anymore. So I looked at him and I said, Jack, I said, thank you very much for that story. I said, but Jack, you're, you're way out there. So I need you to come down here a little bit. I just, I don't even have enough money to buy a car cash. You're talking to dealership. You're just way out of the room. And Jack said, Larry, you're right now, you're talking to Jack, the businessman. And you should have been up here a long time ago. He said, me and Betty, we started down here. We started very small. He says, and we worked very hard for a very long time. He says, and eventually, we made plenty of money. He says, a lot of people don't understand, but it takes two to four years for a business to take off and make money. He says, so we had to give it all we got. He says, and we finally made money. And we took the money from that business. And we rolled it over into the second business. He says that we made a lot of money. And then we were able to secure a credit line from the bank. Once we secured a credit line from the bank, and then we had our own cash in the bank, he said that's what put us in the position to buy the car dealership. And that's how we got all the way up here. He says, but you've been stuck down here for a very long time. He says, do you want to know why? He said, an opportunity came your way. But you didn't take advantage of the opportunity. He said, because your fear was way up here. Your confidence was way down here. He said, you didn't have enough courage to break the fear barrier. He says, you want to know why? He said, because your relationship with God was weak. He said, when you have a secure relationship with God, God gives you this stuff. It's called faith. He says, and faith guides you into the darkness of the unknown and into the light. That light is confidence. He said, confidence and fear don't mix. Confidence is greater than fear. And as confidence blossoms, fear dies off. He said, once fear dies off and confidence is the dominant force in your life, absolutely nothing can stop you. But unfortunately, in your situation, fear was your dominant factor. So the opportunity said, bye-bye. And then what did you do? You punched in at 3 o'clock. You punched out at 11 o'clock. Sick days, holidays, personal days, vacation days. You punched in at 3 o'clock. You punched out at 11 o'clock. Sick days, holidays, personal days, vacation days. And then another opportunity came along, Larry. But you didn't take advantage of the opportunity. You want to know why? He said, because you were lacking motivation. He said, when that opportunity presented itself to you, you were supposed to find out how much the opportunity cost. You were supposed to find out what your operating expenses were going to be. You were supposed to find out who your competitors were. And then you were supposed to figure out how you would be different 
from your competitors, but you didn't do it. 